morning, everybody. Morning. Great to see you all here. Uh, and, and thanks for being here on this beautiful, sunny Friday morning. Um, I know there's probably lots of other things you could be doing. So uh, thank you for, for showing up today. Much appreciated. Um, so uh, I think before I get going, I'd just love to get a sense of has anybody here actually done any work around um, commercial storytelling? That is st st uh, telling stories for a business reason. So maybe you could just give me a thumbs up or just sort of like that or on the thing. So if you if you have. OK, so um, there's going to be quite a lot of knowledge here. All right. So in that case, what I hope to do today is perhaps add some nuances, some distinctions uh, that may add value. Uh, and for those who haven't done any work around um, commercial storytelling, uh, what I hope to do is lay the foundation of it and, and why it's so important. So uh, why is it so important? Well, you know, we are bombarded by more information now than ever before. And the only way in which we make sense of information and data is are the stories that we wrap around it. It's stories that help us make sense of it. So, you know, that is the importance of it. And um, anyone heard of Dan Pink? Anyone watched his TED Talks? Um, so if you haven't, Dan Pink is incredibly influential in the leadership space. And he wrote a book in 2005 called A Whole New Mind. Uh, and what he predicted 17 years ago, 18 years ago, is that storytelling would become one of the six key skills that any business owner, entrepreneur would need to have uh, as part of their repertoire. So, um, as you can see, it's all about power of story uh, because stories are powerful, you know, and that's the key thing. And um, we, we're brought up on stories. You know, once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess living in a magic castle. And that is something that is imbued into our DNA from an early age. And it gets updated from time to time. So those of you who are Star Wars fans may have may recognize this a long time ago in a galaxy far away. And it imbues the idea into us quite often that a story equals fiction. And sometimes we uh, might bump up against that idea when someone tells us they or says to us they want to tell us a story uh what comes into our mind first of all is the idea that it's a fiction but story is not always fiction stories are narratives that help us to answer questions and there are six key questions that a story helps us to answer who what, when, where, why, and how. So Rudyard Kipling's Six Wise Friends. Uh, but then in addition to that, it gives us a bit more. A story well told and well constructed enables us also to get a sense of how long, how much, and which way. So a sense of direction. So when a story is well constructed and well told, it answers a lot of questions in a very succinct and quick manner. Does that make sense? Yeah, is everyone? Yeah, cool. So why should you listen to me about all of this? Um, I know I've met some of you, but not all of you. Well, um, I've done a lot of work in helping people to construct their stories. So um, it's something that I got into about seven years ago. Um, I, I'm a, a, a senior coach, stroke mentor for um, something called the Professional Speakers Academy. And one of the things that we do there is help people construct their business stories. And so I have worked with probably in the region of two to 300 people, ranging from millionaire entrepreneurs, CEOs and C-suite board directors, uh, through uh, individual business owners, solopreneurs, uh, right down to college students, helping them create stories that were relevant to whatever it was they were trying to achieve so that's that's the sort of core reason i think i've got something to offer from that perspective um, i'm also madly interested in how this thing up here works the brain um, i've studied it a lot uh, it's led me to write some books on the subject and um, so for me it sort of really brought home how fundamental stories are to the way we think and i'll talk a bit about that in a second and I've brought all of that thinking into my 
core leadership program, which is called the Intentional Leader Inventory. And one of those eight pillars of that program is the pillar of influence, the ability to get buy-in. Because when you're a leader in whatever you do, there's essentially only two ways you get people to do things. You either tell them what to do or you get them to buy into your ideas. And if you want people to buy in to what you do, if you don't have a relationship with somebody where you can tell them what to do and expect them that they will do what you command them to do, you've got to get buy-in. And the way you do that is through storytelling. So this is the fundamental importance of storytelling in, in my perspective. So is that landing with you okay? Good. All right. So let's get into this. Um, we fundamentally need stories. Um, they go back to our caveman days. So this picture drawn in one of the earliest cave uh, that, that has been found with drawings, about 100,000 years old, essentially tells the story of what people in caveman days could expect when they went out hunting so that they could be prepared. This is the front page of the Barclays uh, corporate report last year. And it says prepared for the road ahead. We're, we're telling the same stories today that we were telling 100,000 years ago. But obviously, the sophistication with which we're able to tell those stories and get them across has fundamentally changed. But the fundamental basis of the story hasn't. It's about giving us a sense of what we can expect in the future. That's the real power of stories. And stories help us move from a sense of chaos to order. They help us to file things and, and give us a, our minds the ability to find the information that we need and make sense of it. And um, for those of you who are familiar with um, some of the ideas of psychology, you, you may have come across the idea of a right hand and left hand brain. Uh, now, in the past, that was very much thought of to be if you were right brained, you were creative. And if you were left brained, you were logical. What the neuroscientists are saying today is that the right hemisphere of the brain is the part of the brain that processes chaos and turns it into something that we can understand and something that we can make sense of. And that is stored in the left-hand uh, hemisphere of the brain. And it, the, the data is uh, transmitted, if you like, between the two hemispheres by this um, part of the brain called the corpus callosum. So this is now recognized by neuroscience as the process by which we turn chaos into order. And one of the fundamental ways in which we do that is the way in which we create stories in our own minds. So is that, some, is that an idea anyone's come across uh, on, on the call today? Yeah? Okay, good. So what this means is when we have stories that connect us to the past, we can actually start predicting the future. And, and that is the fundamental, I use that word fundamental a lot today, I'll have to find a different one. Um, that is one of the core reasons that storytelling has enabled the whole human race to evolve in the way it has and for us to create the things that we, we have done. And it works at this core level within the brain. So you may be familiar with the idea of the reptilian, the mammalian, and the human brain. So the reptilian brain is very much about pr uh, processing the now. It's got a very small aspect of processing the past, but it's all about the now, you know, where to find food. Is the heart beating? Are we breathing properly? That's what the reptilian brain does. The mammalian brain is where we start to store some of the past memories. And we, we know this. We can see this. If you've got a pet, you'll know that your pet has a memory and and, and relates to past experiences but the thing about humans is because we have this front prefrontal cortex which enables us to make stories one of the big problems of being a human is we now spend very little time in the present so if you've ever looked into meditation um, or any sort of spiritual practice what you'll know is a lot of that practice is about getting us out of the past and getting us out of the future which is where we spend most of our time back into the present. And the reason that we spend most of our time in the past is we're, we're thinking and we're making up stories about, about the past so that we can understand what's happened to us and why, so that we can predict a future. So 
this is how stories are so deeply rooted within us and why they're so important for us to make sense of how we can use stories in our businesses uh, and uh, in all our relationships. Uh, is that all uh, sitting with you okay? Is that landed okay with everybody? Give me a sense of that. Yeah, good. Now, if you've been working, uh, as, as you all have, uh, in business for a long time, you've probably bounced up against people who, if you try and tell them a story, they resist it. Just give me the facts. You know, they're very driven like that. And I'm going to look at uh, why this happened, because data tells us what, and, and people want to feel that they've got the facts. Uh, but stories tell us why. And I think we all instinctively know this. Um, but it's very important when you're actually starting to work with stories that you know how to use data and how to use stories depending on the type of person that you're talking to. So I'm going to use the DISC personality profiling model. Um, anybody familiar with DISC? Let me just get a sense of who's familiar with DISC. Okay. Ah, fantastic. I can see there. Gideon, lovely. Love it. So um, I'm a, a qualified, accredited uh, practitioner in disk profiling, and um, I use it a lot. I really love the model uh, because I think it's easy to use and it gives some really great insights. And one of the insights around stories is this. When you think about the different profiles, um, so if you're not familiar with disk, D stands for dominance. People with a D profile are very results oriented and they want things done quickly. Uh, people with I, I stands for influence. They're very people oriented. Uh, they, they love to interact with people. Uh, S stands for steadiness. It's people. These are the people who uh, you might think of as being the caring sort. Uh, people are very important to them, much more so than, than perhaps data and numbers. And C's. Uh, depending on which system of DISC you use, it either stands for conscientiousness or compliance. These people like to have rules in their lives, and um, they're, they're very um, fastidious about detail. And you can see I've drawn a line between the two of them because they fundamentally relate to data and stories differently. So Ds and Cs... One of the essences, if you look back into the roots of DISC, it's about how people trust. And Ds and Cs essentially trust themselves more than they trust other people. And what they want to hear first is your data. They will then make up their own story around that data. And if you're lucky, they will then give you the chance to share your story. So if you're in a meeting, you're pitching, you're selling to, you're negotiating with, these and C's want data first and they want stories afterwards. Yeah. Um, have you ever had that experience? Can I just get a sense um, of having uh, a, a meeting with somebody and you've tried to sort of lead with a story of some sort, but they cut you off and, and they, they, they come out, just give me the facts, just tell me the data. Yeah, I can see Martin raising his hand there, Ollie. You're probably dealing with someone who's a D or a C if they've done that. And the reason that they do that is they can't make sense of what you're trying to tell them until they've got the data. They make their story up. And once they've then got their story, they will then engage with you. But here's the thing. You've got to deliver your, your data in a way that builds trust in them. You're only going to get the opportunity to share your story with somebody who's a DC if, you're shared your, if you've shared your data in such a way that they then trust that the data is valid, that you haven't tried to hide anything, uh, and that you're fundamentally somebody that they then want to hear their story from because time is precious to Ds and Cs. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, if you're dealing with someone who's got a high I or a high S profile, uh, the opposite is, is pretty much true. Um, they want to hear your story first. Um, and they can get quite offended if you lead with data because these are people that like people. So they want that sort of interaction first. And if you lead with data, they're going to feel that you don't get them, that you're not connecting with them. You're not the sort of person that they want. Once you've delivered your story, yeah, they will then probably want to get some data around that to back it up. 
So understanding the type of person that you're working with is absolutely key to being able to successfully tell a story. Yeah. So a lot of people are resistant to the idea of storytelling because maybe they've tried it, they felt it hasn't worked, and they blame storytelling. Storytelling is not the problem. It's telling your story in the right way and understanding who you're telling your story to that determines whether you'll be successful. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. And the objective is to get to this point where actually the story of the person that you're chatting with and your story start to overlap. And the more those stories overlap, that's when you're going to get connection. That's where you're going to make a sale. That's where you're going to get to the point where you might be able to raise money. That's where you get to the point where you can sell the idea of change within your organization. Whatever it is you're trying to be influential in happens when you get stories overlapping. Okay. So getting to the sort of core of it, how do you construct your story? Well, I'm going to um, focus on one uh, format. There are seven key story formats um, that you can see in most uh, films, Hollywood films. Um, but the one I'm focusing on is, is based on the, what's called the hero's journey. So the hero's journey was identified by a guy called Joseph Campbell. He was a professor at Harvard in the 1940s. And he was uh, studying myth the mythologies of the world. And what he discovered was it didn't matter whether you were uh, studying the native Indians of North America, South America, uh, the, the myths of Europe going through Greece into the Far East, uh, India and China and Japan. There was a core fundamental structure which he um, put into a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and it's become known as The Hero's Journey. Um, so I'm not going to go into it in a great deal of depth here. Um, it's really worth it, uh, looking at because pretty much most Hollywood films, uh, certainly adventure films and hero films, are based on that storyline. Um, and it's a really effective way for structuring your business stories. And it basically involves three acts. And I'm going to outline them now. With the hero's journey story, what you're really painting is the picture of a series of adventures, which you can relate to the idea of climbing a pretty big mountain. And I think anyone who has um, started a business and got that business to any sort of scale can relate to the idea that it's climbing a mountain. Ollie, I know you've done that. Does that do did it feel like you were climbing mountains at times? <laughs> I can see the thumbs up there, yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the big mistakes that people make when they're telling stories is they don't like to tell the story of act one and two because that's where the difficulties are what they like to tell is the stories of act three and the problem is if you only tell the story of act three you're not answering all those questions that i outlined earlier and when you don't answer the questions in your story that's what leads to uh you know what salespeople call objections uh in in the process and you then have to deal with them afterwards. So what I'm going to go through is how you can structure your story by telling all of it, act one, act two, act three, so that you minimize the chance that you will be bombarded with objection questions that indicate that the person you're talking with hasn't bought into your story, okay? So in act one, the key element to, to describe is the challenge that you're facing. Now, the challenge can be a challenge that you've identified, or it can be a challenge that has been identified for you by somebody else. And the first part of the story is the description of how you took on that challenge. But inevitably, it leads to some sort of loss or defeat. Because when you're building a business, very rarely, in fact, I can't think of any circumstance where someone has gone from startup to incredible success without things going wrong along the way. And people want to understand that. If you don't talk about the things that have gone wrong and the setbacks that you've had 
fundamentally people don't believe the credibility of a story. So act one is about how you set that up in such a way that it doesn't undermine you, but it actually builds you up as somebody who can take on these challenges. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Act two, what you're going to do is tell the story of how you started to fight back. And that's a story that involves perhaps relating the different things you tried, the things that were successful, the things that weren't, maybe the inspirations that you uh, received from uh, people that you worked with or outside influences. Maybe you had mentors, people who gave you the ideas of how you could overcome the problem. Because if if all you do is say, yeah, I, was, I was in the shower one day and I had this genius idea, um, it suddenly came to me at three o'clock in the morning. Again, it's not most people's experiences. You've got you've to be credible. You've got to be realistic about the process of fighting back and overcoming the setbacks. Because that's what leads you to be able to make a commitment to the next part of the story, which is how you then get to your success. This is act three. And it starts off with the stories of failing forward because you're going to try things. They're not all going to be massively successful, but they're going to give you lessons. They're going to teach you so that you can start having some wins. You start to talk about those wins and then that leads you to your success. So that is the three act hero story structure. And when it's told effectively, it answers most of those questions that I outlined at the beginning when i was talking about the six uh who what when where why how and how much um how long and what direction and when you answer those questions credibly it gives people a lot of confidence in what you are telling them yeah is that is this all landing with you okay yeah good but just repeating this is the bit that most people don't like to talk about but it's absolutely crucial in your story that you do talk about these aspects. And a good story structure will enable you to do that without it undermining your, um, your credibility. But it's not just in the structure, it's in the way you tell it. Um, so you have to believe everything that you are telling uh, because, again, going back to the way the brain works, if there's any any bit of your story that you don't 100% believe in, it will come out in the um, conviction of your delivery. You'll be betrayed by a slight hesitation in your tone of voice. Maybe a, a facial expression gives it away. And we're incredibly sensitive to when there is a lack of congruence between what people are saying and how their body language is showing up. So when you construct a story, an absolutely key element of it is when it's all done, you must 100% believe in it. Because if you don't, you won't be able to deliver it with the impact that it needs to be delivered with. Yeah. Now, maybe you, you might have had an experience where you were telling a story and didn't quite believe in it and started to stumble. And, you know, perhaps it didn't lead to the result you wanted. Um. But this is a key element. So it's not just about construction. It's about developing the skill of delivery as well. What your story is not, your story is not a chronological autobiography of how you went from you know, being a young kid to this amazing success that you are now. This is what makes stories boring and causes people to turn off. What your story is, is an edited version of the highlights of the of your journey that enable people to understand why you've made the decisions that you've made how you've overcome the challenges that you've overcome and therefore why you've been able to create the success that you've created all right so this is what good storytelling does and you need four stories the first story that you need is your expert positioning story. You might think of this as your why. So um, just raise your hand if you're familiar with Simon Sinek. Start with why. Okay, this is your why. Yeah, it's your expert positioning story. So you need a hero story where you are the hero. And you want to have that at your fingertips because 
as Simon Sinek says, people buy what why you do, not what you do. People buy why you do it. You want case study stories, and they can be written in that three-act heroes structure as well. And in this case, when it's a case study, it's your client who is the hero. You want a product story where your product is the hero of the three acts. And then you want your business story where your business is the hero of the three acts. And you want to have these at your fingertips so that, you know, whatever position, whatever situation you're in, you can actually deliver a credible story to uh, whoever wants to hear that. Um, so what I'd like to do is, is share a case study with you now. This is uh, um, Josh. So Josh is the son of a, of a friend of mine. Um, he graduated from university um, in 2020, in the middle of the COVID lockdown. And um, he, like thousands of graduates, needed to get a job. Uh, but Josh has some challenges. And uh, I volunteered to help uh, Josh. And the way that I saw that Josh would be able to break through would be to create some stories. Yeah. So um, what you're going to hear is Josh's story. In fact, you're going to hear two of them. This first one is about a minute and a half. And what I'd like you to do is just see if you can spot the three-act hero story structure. Hello, I'm Josh Parsons. Have you ever faced a challenge that you get to overcome? At the age of four, I was diagnosed with hemiplegia. This is a form of cerebral palsy and caused lots of difficulties within the left side of my body. As you can imagine, this disability posed a lot of challenges that I had to face at school. At the age of 12, I went on the Breathe Arts Health Research Programme it's helped people like me with hemiplegia overcome our mobility issues. The program gave me the confidence to apply these skills at everyday tasks at school. So going into my next school year, I had a lot more confidence to socialise in groups. I felt so passionately about the program that they invited me back on future programmes to teach other young people the skill set that I had learned. Breathe Arts Health Research we invited a TEDx talk in front of 300 NHS representatives with other inclusive therapies. They invited me to come help demonstrate their business. Looking back on it, it was a huge deal for someone like me, just age 17, to go and perform at a corporate level on a TEDx stage. In my life, I've had to overcome many challenges, and there's a quote that really resonates with my story by Nelson Mandela, and it is this. Courage is not the absence of fear but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who feels afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Thank you for watching. In my next video, I'll talk a little bit about how I conquered stage fright. Did you see the structure within that? Yeah. That's, so that's a, a one minute 30 video. What I'm gonna share now, I actually worked with Josh over a year and we created five videos. I'm going to show you the last video now, and then we'll talk a bit about how that uh, worked for him, okay? Hello, I'm Josh Parsons. Have you ever faced a challenge that you get to overcome? So this, this, is the, um, this is the last video. So this is the fifth of a series of five. Um, the first thing that I would say is, if you notice the background now, um, it's providing some more context. So when you're making a video, it's not just your words, but everything, your surroundings, uh, all contribute to the story. Have you ever been in that situation where something changes out of your control? Going into my final year at university, I was really excited. I knew what science was taking, I knew what module was taking, I was finally happy to get on my dissertation. But in December 2019, lecture strikes happened, and I understand why they were striking, but it drastically changed the way in which I was learning. But I was okay with that, I could still go to university. I was happy to get back onto my learning schedule in January. But in March 2020, the pandemic hit, 
and this changed the world for a lot of people. But for me, having to face these last assignments on my own, and with me trying to find my dissertation, I found it very stressful. Quite quickly, the way in which we were learning drastically changed. And shortly after that, all these assignments were changing too. For example, one of the final assignments was to create a live action video production. But with this not pos possible in lockdown, the university were very helpful in securing graphic software to create a graphic presentation from home. It's fair to say, my final year at university was not what I thought it would be. But with the constant changes, I kept having to rethink and reapply myself to different situations to find new solutions. There's a quote that really shares the essence of what I'm trying to say by Joe Polizzi, who is the founder of the Content Marketing Institute. The plan you start out with is never the plan that actually works. Thank you for watching this video. My objective for this video series was to put myself out there in search of getting my first full-time job in digital marketing. If you've seen anything that may be of interest to you or someone you know, please feel free to share it. I really appreciate any help you can give me in taking my next step. The consequence of that was uh, Josh landed an internship with, uh, are you familiar with the Go8, the people who do the uh, assault courses? So they're national. Um, as you can imagine, that was a hotly contested uh, role to get from all of those graduates in that period. Josh won it. Um, and he didn't even have to interview. The guy, when he applied for it, the guy said he'd seen the... Um, uh, the five videos and had a sense of who Josh was and all he wanted to do was have a 20 minute chat with Josh just to get to know him a bit better. When the internship finished, Josh was then able to go on and get a permanent job with a marketing agency. Um, so I use that as actually one of my proudest case studies um, of using stories. Uh, it might not be a business it's an individual but i would suggest if josh can use stories to achieve his goals then you certainly can as well so the last bit i'd like to just sort of put up there and martin i can see you're on the on the call here so you may have a view of this but um my experience is that when you're pitching what you're really pitching for and your pitch is the bait to hook the opportunity to tell your full story. And that brings me to the end. So open up for questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Dean. Dean. Um, we're going to take the screen down and ask if there's any questions from that at all. If anyone's got any uh, points they'd like to raise uh, with Dean this morning. It was an excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. No questions. Oh, I don't think we have. Um, oh, Gideon. Morning. Uh, thanks, Dean. That was really interesting. I, 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 one question to pick up on the on the disc profile um, sure. thing, which I which I, I'm finding it's really useful. I just, I guess, like, do you have any advice or shortcuts of how you might identify people? without kind of, you know, without getting them to fill out a profile. So say it's a, a potential client. I uh, When I meet a potential client and I guess they're accused visually and, and, and you know, what, from what they say sure. as to what profile they fit into. Yeah. Um, so it depends where you're meeting them. Um, if you're meeting them in their office, there are some great visual cues you can look for. It's, it's a bit sort of uh, cliched this, but... Um, if you're meeting with somebody who's a high D profile, what you might find is a bit of a, what looks to you like a disorganized office. It might seem like there's files and everything over the place or, or in this day and age where everyone's got laptops, you might find lots of kit and gizmo all around the place um, and seemingly a bit disorganized, but they'll know where everything is. And if you try and move anything, they'll, uh, they, they get quite angsty about that. Um, that's, that's one way people with a high D tend to talk quickly they tend to talk with um a high level of certainty 
um, and with a, um, a sort of sense that they're in charge. Um, and if you go off on the wrong tack with them, they'll tell you quickly. So if you have the flexibility to pick up, pick up on that, you can then adjust your, the way in which you're delivering accordingly, then you can, you can recover that. Um, people with a high eye profile, they'll probably be wanting to talk to you about whatever's interesting, like, you know, the, the football results, the cricket results or whatever, whatever's going on, you know, you know, if Glastonbury's on and they're into Glastonbury, they'll be wanting to talk to you about Glasto or that sort of thing. And and you'll then have to corral them into actually, can we get on with, you know, what this is about? So there are clues like that. Um, what you also might see if, if you, if you're in their office, um, you might see lots of photos and, or, uh, of family or, or friends or th things like that. There are little clues, you know, um, that of, of where their interest is coming from uh people who are s's um they're going to want to talk to you very much uh, sort of around the people they'll be quite caring about you they'll be interested in what's going on with you um and it's it's really about being open to those clues and cues in in their language uh certainly if you're meeting them outside of their offices um an s type office um could well be similar to a um a, an eye office you might well see uh, photos of family and 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 things like that or you might even have um pictures of you know where, where the kids have drawn uh drawn things at school you know you might even see something like that um with someone who's a high c they're all about detail all about data um and uh particularly if they are qualified, you know, like maybe in finance or law, or whatever, what you might see in their office is certificates on the wall and things like that. Um, that's not to say that all accountants or lawyers are high C, by the way, um, but uh, a lot are. Um, and they'll they'll be uh, very mistrusting of you if you don't give them the 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 evidence that what you are talking about um, actually is, is valid. They will not want to see lots and lots of evidence from you to back up what you're saying. I don't know if that's helpful. Um, it, it sounds a bit cliche. It sounds a bit stereotypical. Super helpful. But yeah, yeah it, super helpful. I think and to understand the audience, to get the right, to get the story right for the audience is obviously critical. And just yeah. an observation. I love, I love your analogy of, of, you know, at one, act two, at three, at the mountain. And, and you see so much of act three, don't you? Like on LinkedIn and stuff. Yeah. And actually you, what you want to hear about is is the journey before that. So that's right. the whole idea of, you know, revealing a bit more, a bit more of the kind of uh, the, the agony and, and the joy is, is great. I think that that's a great, a great um, concept to, to take for us all to take. Thank you. No, cool. And, and that ties into the idea of, of vulnerability as well for anyone who's sort of, Followed the work of Brené Brown and 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 being vulnerable, um, you have to reveal your vulnerability if you're going to tell Act One and Act Two. So that's a great point, uh, Gideon. Yeah, cool. Uh, Neil, great great talk, Dean. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, I, I think it's, it's a question, but I think I think you covered a little bit of it or or some of it in the answer you just gave, Gideon. Um, I really resonated with kind of understanding the type of person that you're talking to and what they need in order to fulfill a, uh, a brief. I had that challenge when I was leading a whole team for Barclay Card and I was the annoying visionary designer and kind of half the time just didn't get why people weren't grasping onto the vision going. And I was taken on a course by EMC that kind of went, well, some people are logical brains. Some people need the detail. Some people need some, you know, these practical tasks to be able to do that. So as soon as I realized, if I'm talking to one of my developers, if I'm talking to the project manager, if I'm talking to the UX consultants, they're looking for things that they understand to be able to actually fulfill the brief. And me talking about the vision about how it's going to change the world of personal finance is really unhelpful to them. <laughs> um, so I guess kind of under understanding that. But do you feel that understanding people's job roles or you can make some assumptions, you know, in regards to the career choices they've made or the environments that are in that give you a starting point in understanding potentially what will engage them with a the conversation. I'd be hesitant around that, to be honest, because mm -hmm. 
you know, you can be an engineer and have a high I profile. You know, you can be a salesperson and have a C profile. You know, you can be a, an accountant, you know, where you've got to deal with lots of detail and, and be a D profile. Um, it's not so much what people do. Um, and, and so one of the things that they talk about when you go through your DISC training is that you really should not use DISC as a core element of your recruitment process in terms of deciding who should do what type of job. Um, that it's helpful in understanding what type of person they, they are and therefore what type of behaviors you'll perceive when they're working. So um, that's really what I was trying to outline to, to Gideon was the type of behaviors. So it's, it's not so much what people do, but it's having an eye for the type of behavior that will give you an insight into what profile they are. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. And then just one other thing I, I wanted to share, I'm kind of inspired by an article I read this morning, um, which was an interview with Johnny Ive, and it made a load of pennies drop, which I think we're all find as founders quite relevant, is that being creative and understanding how to put creativity into an organisation is very, it's very, it's very challenging. He spoke about how when you're inside a large organization, understanding things that are predictable and logical and measurable are the things that make people feel comfortable, which is why it's sometimes hard to put creativity into a uh, into a larger organization. But he also said all founders are creative people um, and why as founders, we seem a little bit more comfortable to deal with the unpredictability of the creative process. So I'm going to share that article uh, a little bit later today, but I just kind of, for me, a penny dropped um, on on kind of understanding some of the challenges um, and moments that I've had in my career going, I'm comfortable with unpredictable, but I'm surrounded by people who are looking for measurable predictability. Cool. There's one thing that a lot of founders I've met over the years, particularly successful ones, they love the chaos of unpredictability, and that's where the opportunity often lies. So, mm. um, uh, well, the, the the flip side of that, using your your coin analogy, is is the the um, the corporates, the C suites, they they crave the opposite. They love predictability and knowing each day that it's going to uh, be the same as the previous one. So, um, no, yeah, great. That's great. Please share that, uh, Neil, on our um, on our WhatsApp group. I'll be very keen to read that. That's a, it's great. Dean, wonderful talk. Um, Thank you. Let's keep the conversation going around storytelling. It's a very, very important part, um, part and parcel of a, a founder's uh, journey. It really is. Um, I know Martin is a huge advocate of that and um, how, how the importance of storytelling. In, in in whatever way you're using it, um, as you outlined at the top of the call. You're going to get a lot of love today, Dean. On Fantastic. And various other social media platforms, I'm sure. Um, and we're going to give you some crazy big ups. All right? Thank you for that. Appreciate you're it. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again, Have everyone, for coming along. Have a great weekend, all.